Good morning. morning. We can be sunny inside even if it isn't outside, right? We have a number of announcements this morning, but we also want you to pay attention to the announcements in the bulletin. First announcement this morning is the new membership class will meet immediately after church today, around 11 o'clock, here in the front of the sanctuary. We want to thank uh, the people who were responsible for the auction last Sunday, and uh, all the funds will go to the mission committee, and we took in over $3,000, so it was quite a successful (laughs) event. Uh, Paul Perriman died, and his funeral will be this week. It's up in Michigan, and uh, we think that uh, Ron will be getting us the address so we can send cards to the family. Uh, I think they would greatly appreciate that. You also had little cards in your bulletin that um, we want you to fill out, because that's the attendance record. And if you have joys or concerns or prayer requests, uh, you can check those or write them on the back. So we want to make sure that you're doing that. I know that's a new feature that we're having, but uh, it's something that we need to be working on and developing. I think we have an announcement by Darren this morning. Good morning. As you can tell, the weather is cooperating with us today. Um, We've had to cancel our canoe and kayak for today, but we are looking at different dates. But as you can tell by the insert in the bulletin, we have an awful lot planned already for this year. So um, we will get back with you on that. But the big important thing is we are having youth group tonight. So 5 o'clock it will start, and I hope everybody can come that can be there. Thank you. And Greg, I think you're on next. Good morning. I'm coming to you this morning as uh, in the, a new role. I'm, I'm now working for you as financial secretary, which, as you may recall, that job has been done Uh, admirably for the last many years by Annie Bates. She's done a tremendous job and she spent some time. Yeah, let's give Annie a hand. She did. She served us faithfully and she spent a few weeks training me in the process. And so I'm now uh, working in that role, uh, recording and keeping track of the contributions and that. Uh, Sam Hoover has taken my place uh, on the Finance Committee as Finance Chairman, so he's serving in that role now. So just to let you know some changes in Finance Committee. But we've had a few, uh, we'll have a few weeks here where we're talking about giving to the church. It's our annual stewardship campaign. And uh, Pastor Bob asked me to say a few words about electronic giving. That is a way that you can set up to have your donations made. If you, if you ever get tired of writing those checks, and if you, particularly if you know what your pledge is and what you intend to give on a weekly or monthly basis, there are ways to have that happen automatically and electronically and just save you the time of writing the checks. There's a couple main ways. One way uh, a number of you are already using is through online banking. With your bank, uh, you probably have that option available uh, for online banking and through that where you can set up automatic bill payments. And you can use that application to have uh, checks dispersed to the church for your, for your donations if you, if you so choose. And there's a way you can do that to repeat so you can have it uh, the same amount cut and sent to the check every month or every week. That can be done uh, as many of you are doing already. Another way, maybe you don't use online banking or, uh, or don't want to use that avenue, you can also set up automatic transfers, which will just happen, um, again, set up on a periodic basis of weekly, monthly, but the amount can be taken right out of your checking account and transferred directly into the church's checking account, and that can be done uh, no matter where you bank, uh, and that 
uh, the, the, the means of setting that up, we can help you with, and, and mainly just to let you know that that contact can be made with Gene in, in the church office to help, help get that set up. But it just takes a little communication with the bank to get, to get a transfer set up that way. And it can make it just something you won't have to remember, and it can happen uh, throughout the year if you're traveling, if you're gone for part of the year. It just makes, it makes your giving that much easier. And you'll notice there's something new in the, in the pews. Uh, Pastor Bob has designed a, a, a flyer that says, I'm an e-giver. And he's used this in other churches. And it does a couple of things. The idea is, if, if you're giving electronically, you can take that flyer and just lay that in the, in the plate, in the donation plate as it's coming by. And so it does, uh, for one thing, it takes care of that stigma you may have of passing that plate by without putting anything in. Some people feel bad about that. But if you, if you put that in, you, that, just, that just lets people know that you are giving even though there's nothing going in out of your pocket that day. Uh, the other thing it does, as people see that being done or see you putting that in the plate, it, it, uh, it brings that to their mind and makes them curious and maybe they check in to, to just, just what that is and how that giving is taking place. So just wanted you to notice those and uh, feel free to, to start using those if they, if they are applicable. Uh, a couple other things I'll mention about giving at this time of year. Remember that besides cash, you can give other assets to the church uh, as donations. Uh, you can donate stock to the church and that uh, the church does have a, a stock account and we, we do hold investments, so, so stocks can be transferred directly to the church into, into that account. And one nice thing about donating stock is, uh, you may be aware of this, but if you're holding stocks that have grown over the years in value, and you know that someday when you sell those, there's gonna be a capital gains and tax to pay, if you donate stock to a church or charity, you get credit for the full value of that donation, in other words, today's value of the stock, but you get credit for that without ever having to recognize a capital gain on the stock. So that's a, that's a nice way to, to uh, transfer an asset tax-free. Uh, other assets, people have given cars to churches, given boats, uh, maybe, maybe some of you have RVs. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking about getting rid of those at some point, and that, that, that's a donation that could be made to the church and you get full credit for, for the current value. Uh, and one more thought, this, as we enter this last quarter of the year, it's a time when um, you might be thinking about uh, IRA distributions. And just an annual reminder that if you're over the age of 70 and a half and have uh, a required distribution from an IRA, or, or not required, but if you're over 70 and a half, you can have money transferred out of your IRA directly to the church, and that money would never then be counted in your taxable income. It's called a QCD, Qualified Charitable Distribution, and, uh, and a number of you, as we've made this comment, have taken advantage of that, and just something that you'd be able to let your uh, investment advisor know if you want to make that type of a transfer. So some things to think about as you prayerfully consider your giving to the church. So thank you and God bless. Thank you, Greg. It's so wonderful to have people who really understand money uh, like Greg and Sam, and they're such a blessing uh, to the church. And so some of you may be visitors here today and you think, oh, great, they're talking about money again. And so this is our stewardship campaign. It runs three weeks, and I made a promise to you last week, and I'll hold that promise true yet today, that we'll get through this campaign and talking about biblical stewardship and what that means. And then the rest of the year, we don't talk about money. We talk about love and care and faithfulness, and we talk about those types of things. And so uh, thank you for being here. I just want to remind you that this stewardship cam campaign um, lets us know that we're on a mission from God. Now, there's a lot of excitement in the Middlebury First United Methodist Church about what's going on, and people are coming and coming back, and we're starting new ministries, and so we're on a mission 
from God to make those ministries work and to be a vital church and, and um, a blessing to the Middlebury community. Amen. And so, um, so we need uh, your gifts, your tithes, your offerings to make those ministries work. Today we have a very special speaker, uh, Herb Bowalda, who's coming to speak. Now, Herb helped you raise the funds to build this beautiful church. He was key and integral in working with your leadership. And so I just thought it would be so wonderful to have him come and see the goodness of what you have done and to share a message uh, with us. We continue to keep the 10 apples um, up here with the, the, the one green uh, for the 10% that God would have us uh, to give today. I also want to mention that I, this is my second week of the Moses Bible study, and it's going so good. And I want to invite anyone who wants to be a part of that to continue to be a part of that. It meets at 845, and we finish at 930 uh, for those who need to get into the um, choir. And so just jump in. Uh, the water's fine. Will you stand with me this morning, and let's do the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Church membership is an opportunity for someone to say that we like what's going on at this church and we want to be part, come on up here, when we want to be part and pull along with you as we make ministry differences in the Middlebury and surrounding communities. When we make that commitment, it is no longer about us. It is about others who we want to become Christians into the faith. So these two have now come to say they want to be part of our church fellowship. So I want to introduce to you Cameron Hall and Courtney Singer. Cameron um, is from um, Iowa, right? And you work in the chicken industries as an engineer. Um, and so, Courtney, you work at the hospital. And what exactly is your job again? Pediatric speech therapist. Okay, so we're so excited that both of them have jumped into the church in a big way in some leadership positions. So we're so excited uh, for them. So we have these questions that I want to present to you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you both, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sins? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. According to the grace given you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, say, I will. Now, this is a two-part um, covenant and agreement. So they just made some promises to the Lord, but also they made promises to you. But you, as the church family, are also making a promise to them that you're going to care for them. You're going to love them. You're going to be their brothers and sisters in Christ until God calls us all home. So on the top of page 35, you have a part as well. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and recommit um, and your commitment to Christ? If so, say we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help. Now, we had 11 people in the membership class uh, last Sunday, and we have another class um, this morning, the second part of that. And if you'd like to know more, be a part of the church, we'd like to invite you uh, to that class directly after the service. I'd like to invite Jerry up. We have a, a gift that we would like to give them. Um, if you could come up, please. Is he? 
There he is. Let's give him a hand. So one of the things that I'm so excited about is because these two young people have joined us. By joining today, they dropped our uh, average down by five years, and that's a really good thing. So God bless you. Thank you. Our prayer hymn as we go into our time of prayer is Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. It's verse 1. It's on page 358 or also the words are on the screen. Let's sing that as we enter into our time of prayer. And we continue our time of prayer as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the handbell choir uh, to come forward. Um, what you're going to hear is something beautiful with both the handbell choir and the chancel choir to sing. And so may you be blessed. And thank you so much, handbell choir and choir, for blessing us in this way.
I have the privilege to introduce a dear friend, colleague in ministry, and mentor. So the year was 1999. I'd been a youth pastor in Springfield, Georgia, after I got out of the military and just finished my seminary. And Nancy and I had three young children at the time, and we really wanted to be closer to family. And my family lived up here in northern Indiana. And so I began to kind of put feelers out there to the bishop up here that I wanted to come back home. And I was connected through actually a website on youth specialties about this church in South Bend, Clay United Methodist Church. And I sent in my resume, and I received a phone call from Pastor Herb Bewalda, and we began to talk, and we felt that it was a good connection. And usually, um, pastors aren't supposed to try and make appointments for other pastors, but he was able to do that, which shows his strength and um, leadership within the conference. Coming to Clay United Methodist Church, one of the things I really wanted is I wanted someone who was a bold maverick and uh, a leader for change, and that's exactly who Herb Bualda was, and he took a church where he came in and grew it to a wonderful, large-sized uh, ministry, and my years of working with him were just a delight and a joy. The bishop then sent me to um, Argus, and then from there I became a senior pastor, but I'll never forget all that I learned and the wonderful opportunity that Herb gave me to be the youth minister and praise and worship leader at Clay United Methodist Church. Since that time, every now and then I would get stumped on a question being a new pastor. My first call was to Herb Bewalda, and every time he would say, this is what you need to do, and it was such great advice. About, I don't know, six or seven years ago, he called me and said, Bob, would you like to go to Africa on a mission trip to help um, learn more about digging freshwater wells in the villages of Burkina Faso? And I said, yes, I would love to go with you. And so Herb was able to bring leadership from many different churches to go to Burkina Faso. And one of the times that we were um, in learning about all that there was, we stopped at a seminary um, where they taught pastors uh, from all over Burkina Faso to become pastors and then send them out. And so we got done, and they presented Herb with this beautiful robe. Um, and uh, because he was a leader and we were bringing um, gifts and money and to help their ministry, and it was just a beautiful day. And at the close of the day, Herb came to me and said, Bob, I want you to have this robe because, A, I would never wear it, and I know you will wear it. <laughs> and he was right because every time we did a, a, a sermon on missions or something, I would um, wear a robe that looked something like this. And so, Herb, I wear this for you today. You are exactly right. We're not talking about missions, but this is my robe from Africa. The second part that I think is so key to the connection for this church is that Herb Bewalda walked with you when you raised money for this beautiful vision and church that you had. And so as I was putting the sermon series together, I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we brought Herb back to share his vision and to go through step two? Now that you have this wonderful, beautiful church to minister, what's next? Herb, come and share with us. Thank you. It is a joy to be here. And... Uh stand in this holy place. My father always called this the sacred desk. Sacred desk. The place where the words of God come across this desk into the hearts and the lives of people. So it's an honor. Uh, to be anywhere at a sacred desk, but uh, especially here with uh, Pastor Ron, Pastor Bob, and Nancy, and uh, Lori, uh, it's a thrill for me to see what you're doing. I asked Bob uh, how long I could preach. He said, 25 minutes. But a moment ago, he said, take as long as you want but everyone's going to leave at 11.15. <laughs> Bob Hamm, our choir director at Clay Church, he knows, uh, remembers Bob, 
told me one time after worship, you are a 27-minute preacher. And I said, what does that mean? He said, it means it doesn't matter what you're going to say, you're going to take 27 minutes to say it. I said, is that a good thing or a bad thing? He said, well, that's a thing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm watching my clock here this morning. The Apostle Paul said, but since you excel in everything, and Middlebury has always excelled in many things, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Eugene Peterson, in his book, Under the Unpredictable Plant, speaks of the role of a pastor in the life of a congregation. He says something kind of amazing. He says, what pastors do, or at least what pastors are called to do, is really quite simple. When I first read that, Bob, I thought, has it been simple for me? You people are like herding cats for a pastor. <laughs> Trying to get you to go in one direction and all go together and all arrive there and all be happy about it at the same time. What pastors do, or at least are called to do, is really quite simple. And then he tells us what he means by that. Pastors say the word God. Pastors show up and say the word God so congregations can stay in touch with the basic realities of their existence so that they know what's going on. Pastors say the name God personally alongside the parishioners in the actual circumstances of their lives. It may have been in a hospital room, it may be on a street corner, it may be in the counseling office. They say the name God. They say that name in the circumstances of their lives so that they will recognize and respond to the God who is both on our side and at our side when it doesn't seem like it and we don't feel like it. Pastors show up and say, God. That's the pastor's job. That's the pastor's vocation. That's the simple thing that pastors need to do at the heart of their ministry. And that's what I'm here to do today. I'm not here to give advice. Certainly not here to talk about sociology or psychology or politics, for heaven's sake. I'm here to say God to you and to point you beyond the disturbing news of the world to the one who through the scriptures points us to life. This is how I want to say it to you today. I'm convinced that in the Bible, in a story that you've heard many times, there is a big question and that big question is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian and how to live a Christian life. And it's a question that each of us have to answer for ourselves. And when we answer it, it changes everything. Now, you may or may not know that Jesus was asked a lot of questions in the Gospels. In fact, he was asked 283 questions. How many questions did you think he answered? All of them? Half of them? A quarter of them? Nope. He answered seven of them. Most of them he responded to with a question of his own. And the text that I've selected for today is from Luke chapter 18. Jesus is asked a question. It's kind of a hybrid. Jesus is asked a question. 
Jesus responds with a question. The man answers the question. And then Jesus gives a powerful, striking, unsettling, difficult, somewhat frightening answer to the man. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the sometimes disturbing stories and questions that Jesus has asked. We pray somewhere in the midst of these words that are spoken as we reflect on this big question, we each would find your voice speaking in each one's life. I pray this in your name. Amen. So obviously the ruler was troubled. Something was going on with him and he had an important question and so he sought out the traveling vagabond rabbi with his question. He seems insecure. He has some doubts about himself, about how he lives. He wants the rabbi to give him the answer. I find it amazing that this guy understands that he lacks something. He understands that something is missing. Something is in the way for the life that he's seeking. And he asks the right question. Jesus didn't have to tell him what the question was. It was already in his heart. He just didn't have the answer. And he walked away from the life that he was seeking. I've been reflecting on my own life with this text. It sounds a little familiar to me. It's not unusual when, for me to get a little nervous when I think God is sneaking around in my life opening up a new door that might seem a little scary to go through. We may grumble sometimes when God comes to us in that quiet voice, convicting us about something that we know is missing because it's too much, it's too big, it's too out of reach. What does God expect of me well you have time yeah but I'm busy I've, I've got this to do and that to do and this to do and that to do what about your time how will you invest your time in God's work God's kingdom what about your talents what about your gifts I don't know if I have any gifts I'm not a very talented person now that guy over there he's got a lot of gifts ask that guy what about your gifts? What about how God has made you? What about my treasure? 
Hey, I work hard for my money. It's my money. Why should I give it to anyone else? Maybe someone else needs it more than you. It can feel like a daunting task to be a follower of Jesus. It stretches us into a new shape. It's a challenging thing. Sometimes it's disturbing at first, and the later it feels so fulfilling to have joined God in what God cares about. But the good news, when we feel that unrest about responding to God's voice, the good news is we do not do the work alone. No one is gifted with the amount of time. No one is gifted with the kind of talents needed. No one person is gifted with the kind of resources that are necessary. That's why we do it together. This is how the body of Christ works. God puts us all together so that all together we can do all that God asks us to do. There are different kinds of gifts. But the same Spirit distributes them. You've got a gift. There are different kinds of service. But the same Lord. We serve in different ways. But we all serve. There are different kinds of working. But in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. If we think there's only one person that has the gifts, that has the talent, has the time, that has the resources, we limit what God does in Middlebury. Because at the benediction, I told my congregations, church is not over. At the benediction, church has just begun. And we are launched out into the streets of community to live for him with our talents, with our time, and with our resources. You may remember the capital campaign. I remember over at the old church standing in that side room off the sanctuary, and I had preached that morning, and I was trying to help the congregation understand what it was going to take to do what they wanted to do because they wanted to raise $2 million, and I think at the time their budget was $340,000. So I just wanted them to be realistic about their expectations. So I said, well, if you raised one times your budget, or $340,000, that would be a good campaign because you still have to raise your budget for three years while you're raising another $340,000 for the building. If you raised two times your budget, that would be about $750,000. That would be a great campaign because you have to raise twice your budget over a three-year period, and still raise your budget three times. If you raise three times your budget, it's going to be a fantastic campaign. That would be about a million dollars. But they wanted to raise two million dollars. And I said, that would be more than six times your budget. Larry Carlson was in the back. And Larry Carlson said, what do you call that kind of campaign? I said, I call that a miracle campaign. And what gave me hope that day was it didn't fall on a deadness in the room, a silence in the room, like, oh my, we had no idea. When he said that, you all broke out in laughter and in applause. And I thought to myself, they know something I don't no, and we set a goal for 70% of the congregation to step up and to meet a rally goal of making a commitment. We didn't tell them what to make, but making a commitment. This is the only campaign I led, led Bob, where we had 100% of the numbers of cards that we thought were possible were returned. And they didn't raise $2 million dollars. They raised $2,156,000 toward this facility. No one person does that. No one person puts the resources in like that. 
and they shouldn't. This is our work. We are the body of Christ. We live our faith together, trusting in God, staying in harmony with each other, praying daily that God's voice, convicting voice sometimes, would break out into our lives and begin to nurture us to some new challenge that we could do here in Middlebury and also by taking very seriously what I call the big question. You heard it in the scripture this morning. When the ruler asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, sometimes when we read that scripture, we think all that this person is asking is, how do I get to heaven? That's not what the question means. In the New Testament Greek, this phrase, eternal life, refers both to a quality of life and, the, of course, eternity with God. In essence, what he was asking if we paraphrased it, would be this. What must I do to have the life that you want for me? Because eternal life doesn't begin in the funeral parlor. Eternal life begins when we have faith in a living God who is speaking into our lives. And so this prayer... What must I do to have the life you want for me? This prayer is at the heart of everything for a Christian, in our families, in our relationships, in our vocations, in our values, in our ethics, in our decisions, in our morals, in our lifestyles, in our choices, in our church life, and yes, in what we do how we invest our money. The heart of it is this question. What, oh Lord, do I have to do to have the life you want for me? Deep down, we wrestle with it because we know in our heart, like this guy knew. We're called to a different kind of life than, than we're living, where God is in charge. Gene Peterson, in his book, The Contemplative Pastor, talks about the challenge we face in getting off the throne, allowing God to be in charge. He says it this way. As a pastor, I, I didn't like being viewed as, a nice, as nice but insignificant. I bristled when a high-energy executive leaving the place of worship with a comment, this is wonderful, pastor, but now we have to get back to the real world, don't we? He says, I, I thought we were in the most real world. The world revealed as God's. The world invaded by God's grace and turning on the pivot of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. This executive's comment brings me up short. He isn't taking this seriously, this thing called the Christian life. Worshiping God is marginal to him, to making money. Prayer is marginal to the bottom line. Christian salvation is a brand preference. That's all it is. And then I remember, as a pastor, I'm being subversive. I have to be subversive to be a pastor. My long-term effectiveness depends on my not being recognized for who I really am. If he realized that I actually believe that our way of life is doomed to destruction and that another kingdom right now is being formed in the, in the secret to take its place, he wouldn't be at all pleased. I, as a pastor, am being subversive. I am undermining the kingdom of self 
and establishing the kingdom of God. I am helping them become what God wants them to be. Did you know that? All these years, these kind-hearted, sweet pastors have been sneaking around in your life trying to knock you off the throne and help you discover a life of discipleship where God's Holy Spirit was directing you. Undermining the kingdom of self, establishing God's kingdom in our hearts, leading us to a radically different kind of life. Now listen, I know your pastor. I know Bob and Nancy. I know their children. I know where their hearts are. We worked together for several years. Heartbreaking for me when he was moved. Pastor Bob has big ideas. I found myself wondering when the man ever slept. Bob will be relentless in Middlebury, fulfilling whatever God asks him to do. He will not stop. Get ready for it. Our staff parish committee had to tell him to turn in a report every month about his activities. You know why? They wanted to know how many days he was taking off. I guarantee you by word and by example, he will challenge you. Nancy will challenge you to live a radically different kind of life because they believe in the big question. What must I do to have the life you want for me? We answer that personally. And then when we answer that personally, we become part of the community that's completing God's mission right here. 1999, just before Bob came to join us, I was appointed from the College Avenue Church, the, the Ball State campus, to be the pastor at Clay Church. I started noticing, when I was first new there, uh, two women on staff, Jeannie and Sue, would come down the hallway out in the parlor with a cart and they had grocery bags on it, paper bags. I didn't know what was in the bags. But I was too busy trying to figure out my own job, you know, talking to people, answering the phone, trying to figure out where I was and what the church needed. I finally bumped into them one day and I said, where are you going with those bags? We're going over here with the circle drive. But what are you doing? I see you doing it all the time. She says, there are people that come here for food. Come here for food. Yeah, the people who come here for food. Now, I knew the church was in desperate straits financially. I said, you have a budget for that? She says, no, we don't have a budget for it. But people have called here, four or five families. I can't remember how many. Not very many, just enough to fit on a cart with some bags. I said, where do you get the food? She said, we go buy the food. You, got, you buy the food? Yeah. But why do you buy the food? And they said... The most amazing thing. Because the people are hungry. The church found out about their sacrifice, started making donations. Church learned. They could do something about hungry people. So this week, I called Sue Zumbrin. I'm a volunteer now in the, in the food pantry, old retired, retired pastor. I said, Sue, she's in charge of the pantry now. It's open on uh, Monday mornings from 9 to 12. No. Monday mornings from 12 to 3, Thursday mornings from uh, 9 to 12. So 
said, how many families did you serve last month? 750. Now, they keep track of these families. How many people does that represent? 2,500. Supported by donations. It's the largest team in the church committed every week to be there. What, what have they done? They have answered the question without knowing the question, what must I do? Another congregation over by Fort Wayne during a stewardship campaign, the cards had already been mailed out, cards like the cards you have about the commitment to the annual campaign had already been mailed out. They were starting to come back in the mail and they would go to the church secretary's office. She brought one down to me. I didn't know why to look at their, their commitment, but it was addressed to attention, Pastor Herb. When I looked at the return address, I felt my hair stand up on the back of my neck and I felt so ashamed of myself for not taking their card out of that mailing. It was from John and Ruth, a young family in our church with three young children. Ruth was a homemaker, had no money. John was laid off. He was a draftsman. He had no job. They had no income. And I forgot and mailed them a card. I opened it up, expecting to be blasted across the room about my uncaring spirit. Of course, there was no number written on the, on the line. But it was the most dynamic card I had ever received. John and Ruth, a homemaker and unemployed draftsman trying to raise three children without a job, wrote on that card, Pastor Herb, we will give 10% of whatever we have. They didn't know the question, but they knew the answer to the question. What must we do as a family to have the life God wants for us? Their lives were a witness to that big question. Jeff Schinnebarger in his book, More or Less, says choosing to do something significant in life usually requires sacrifice in our personal convenience but the results can be life-changing for ourselves and for those around us. What about you? As you approach another year of mission and ministry at the beginning of this exciting chapter with Pastor Bob and Nancy Vale, will you pray this prayer every week? Oh, Lord, what must I do to have the life you want for me. Let us pray. Lord, help us to listen for your voice, hearing what you say to each one of us as we answer this question for ourselves. Thank you for your goodness and for this opportunity to join you with our lives in your transforming work. So what a blessing it is to, uh, to minister with you again. And so thank you so much. So next week is our last Sunday for the stewardship campaign. Pastor Ron is going to speak. And if God would have you fill this out and uh, turn it in and the offering plate um, or to the church office next Sunday, we will all uh, turn that in. And then following that, our uh, Greg and the Sam and the finance committee, they'll develop a, a um, budget for you. Now, March, I think it was, I interviewed here, 
and um, was accepted to be your pastor. Uh, one of the first phone calls was to this guy. And he said, you are going to do so great. That's the miracle church. That's the miracle <laughs> church. And I believe that God's got so many more miracles in the years to come. Amen? Amen. With your gifts and with your ministry and with you serving. Let's stand together for the benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May God bless us all until we meet again. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you all. Amen. You're dismissed.